end this video with before we get into the meat. Um, this video is entitled Plato, Trump, and the Long Culture War. I teach logic and critical thinking. So Trump saying that you aren't allowed to think critically about American institutions goes right at my whole job. The point is that any real progressive vision, that is any uh, vision that is trying to realize freedom, has to include a principle of realization in its essence, which means that it's not enough to know what a better American looks like. And I can give you the hard detail, and I've kind of done that over the course of weeks about what a better rights agenda looks like. Um, you need to account for how you're going to work the electorate to get there. And since a better America means more self-determination, this vision of a better America can't be imposed from without. And that's, uh, it has to be developed from within. We have to change what people are scared of. Right now they're scared of the pain of hunger and then move them to be more scared of the harm of slavery. Right? Because as long as you're scared of pain instead of like this dignitary harm, you could always be offered um, and in like a dishonorable life that is devoid of pain, right? Um, so we have to change what they know. That's one thing. And, but we have to also change what they're willing to fight for. And these are, this, does, this is about a deep cultural battle, right? So it's not just about what they choose, but how they come to adopt um, the principles that govern their choice. And it's not merely an intervention that comes through school. I'm talking about a more global intervention, family, schools, churches, because if you just work at the top level with trying to get people to vote and change their vote, it's going to end anti-black. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with Democrats or Republicans. And I think the people who are advising Trump to fight this critical theory culture war battle, they know this. They know that as long as politics and journalism is about opinion polls and the stock markets, they are winning. Regardless of what the opinion polls say or the stock market, whether that's in their favor. Right? Because they're not actually, because if you're talking about those things, you're not actually talking about or conceiving why you should fight for a better America. You've already taken America on um, the terms that are given. And with that, we'll get to the video. America, my name is Ami Jose Frimpong, and you're watching this week's edition of the uh, Black Athenians. And I come to you every Friday to talk a little bit about political wisdom. And I think we're going to get pretty wise today so sit back as people file in i want to pose a question to the people i might have a question that i pose every week that'll be of this caliber i don't know but i'm definitely going to pose it this week and it'll be a a good little warm-up exercise before we start doing the real political philosophy so kamala harris has been deplaning um in fashionable foot attire first time it was uh Chucks, um, style of shoe. The next time she came down, she kind of lounged off the plane in a pair of Timberlands and apparently was supposed to feel like that's uh, a, a signal to our culture as if like we're going to get jobs now, good jobs at fair wages because Kamala Harris wears Timberlands. That means she understands our struggle. And, and I was just thinking, and you know, her press team is really pushing this angle. I think they're doing it. They're making the same mistake Elizabeth uh, um, Warren made insofar as they think they think all black people are bougie or want to be bougie, and that's just not the case. So <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, like, I say this because Elizabeth Warren is very serious about using Latinx every time, except Latinos themselves consider themselves Latinos because that's the way the grammar works, and they haven't decided to change their language yet. So you should probably just use the language that the people who speak the language use themselves but instead she was like very woke and so far as she always used latinx but um and you know it turns out nobody voted for her. so i feel like kamala harris is going through the same thing she's gonna try to you know think she's gonna you know, get all of the black people to come out and vote for her and because she wears uh, Chucks or she wears uh, Timberlands. And I don't think it's going to work because I think a lot of black people just want to know someone's going to secure them a good job at a fair wage. Or, you know, some sort of capitalizer business or deal with their medical debt. So I, I, I don't think it's going to work, but, you know, Kamala Harris is Kamala Harris. I think they're trying to sell her as Simone Biles, who's actually awesome. And instead, it turns out she's more like Anna Kodakova, who just kind of, you know, looks good, depending, right? 
So Democrats think Kamala Harris is Simone Biles when she's actually Anna Konnikova. And I said that, and someone else responded on Twitter, I think very well, uh, exactly this. Kamala Harris is more like Hillary Blanks than Claire Huxtable. And I was like, that's right. I think she is more like Hillary Blanks than Claire Huxtable. Then I started thinking, you know, I've always had problems with the Huxtables. And let me, and this, is, this gets to our question. This question for today, people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the people of the internet. You can hash this out in the comments. Who did it better? Claire and Heathcliff Cuxtable or Florida and James Evans? I think, all right, so I think it's the Evanses. I'll say it again. I think it's the Evanses because the degree of difficulty is off the charts with the evidence, 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 Evanses. I mean, Heathcliff and Claire had two professionals, parents, I mean, grandparents in the mix. Uh, there were two professionals and pretty much an infinite amount of money and enough space in their house. And they still ended up with, like, Sandra, who ended up with a wilderness store, two doctors. I mean, like, ended up marrying, what's his name? But, like, ended up in a wilderness store. Like, they, they, they gave this black family white people problems and then ended up giving them white people solutions. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so, and then Denise was aimless, who needed to get saved by marrying a military guy. Look, I don't even know, like, anybody could have married a military guy in a way, as a way to get stability. You didn't need to be the child of a doctor and a lawyer raised with an infinite amount of money. Like, if, if the only way your daughter can be saved is marrying into a military family, if you had all of that going for you, you failed as a parent. Like... Like, that's the easiest way to go. Like, I could have strung out daughters and end up them marrying a military guy and that having, like, rescued them from the gutter, right? So that's, it's cheating. I'd expect more Heathcliff and Claire. And then the rest of the kids were just kind of forgettable and boring, right? And then they slept on Theo's dyslexia. Don't forget that. They, 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 he was dyslexic and they just treated him like a dog. Um, so I don't really think Heathcliff and Claire were that Com com considering what they had going for them, I don't think they were that great of parents. And then you had Florida and James. You know? They got to take an L with JJ. But they didn't kick him out. But, you know, you got to take an L with him. Michael is the best kid of all of the kids. Cosby kids or, um, or Evan's kids. And Thelma was fine. And Thelma was fine. I'm just saying. Thelma was fine and Thelma was fine so like i i have no problem i have zero problem with them i have zero problem with michael jj you know you took a whoops but james i remember an episode with james was talking about he got third grade education right and there was another ed episode where michael came in and james and michael got in it and james at, by the end of the episode like learned from michael and like so james showed a humility that i don't ever remember bill ever ever having about anything so who did it better I think, I think James in Florida. And if you add in the degree of difficulty, off the, like James in Florida win as a walk, at, like in a walk, it's, it's not even close. Because if you have everything that Heathcliff and Claire had going for them and you just end up with those five, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, you can work this out in the comments. But now let's talk about what I came here to talk about. That is Trump. Plato and the long culture war. And I'm going to hit that after the beat. To the beat, yo. Uh, yeah. Sound good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. And we're back. So Trump, Plato, and the long culture war. So here's the problem with the left or progressive politics in general. You have to have a principle of realization in the essence of the politics. I'll say this. You can't just articulate what a better world looks like. You need in your articulation of what a better world looks like an account of how we get there, right? Or your better world is just idealistic fantasy. Right, so in the account of what a better world looks like, 
You need as some sort of story about how we go from here to there and what needs to change. Right? So halfway through the Republic, that's Plato's masterwork, he talks about how, um, great, we've designed this great city, and we've designed this great city for them, and we've done our work. But Glaucon says, you know, that doesn't really, how do, how do you account for the, the, the people who designed the city? <laughs> like, how do you account, like, you need some sort of principle of a great city that accounts for its sustenance and its coming into being from not a great city. Because if you can't do that, then what are you talking about? All right, so he's like, oh, well, we have to go back to the, the drawing board. So all the, great, so all the great progressive and leftist policies in the world don't mean anything if you can't account, if you don't have some sort of story internal to the policy, internal to the program, that accounts for how you go from here to there. So I'm going to get. So I tell you the story. The, the story is we need to actually take over cultural institutions and change people's ideas about the role of governing in their lives, and we need to actually muscularly take over um, control. And and I think the, this is suggested in uh, the Republic in different ways, but for the most part, we need to take over the the cultural institutions that inform what people know about politics and justice and take over the cultural institutions that informs people's willingness to fight what their willingness to fight for. If they are more scared, because if they're more scared of pain than they are of harm, if they are more scared of pain, for example, than they are of like the harm of slavery, then even if they know what the right thing to do is, they don't have, they're not going to have the quality of, to, to fight for it. So if you're serious about bringing, of, of making us free, black people, if you're serious about making black people free, if you're serious about bringing justice to the United States, you need to start thinking about the long culture war in terms of changing what people know and changing what people are willing to fight for and what they're scared of, what constitutes a harm, right? Two kind of different things. And, and uh, in the Republic, one of them is like total logistical um what the people's reason and also and there's a toe uh uh which is just people's heart or a sense of honor and that's what they're willing to fight for so you need to work on those institutions and those institutions i think come from um those institutions come from the way we think about what is a fundamental meaning that means our families our churches uh, some people think about property this way, but pretty much wherever freedom becomes expressed. And I'm going to show you. And so, I, you know, I've said this for a while that unless we if we're not serious about taking on the white family, um, there's not going to be justice because that's where they learn their entitlements. So unless you're going to change uh, the norms that govern the white family, then you're just wasting your time, I think. I think because that's part of the realization of freedom. Because no matter what you, you know, tell people, if they learn something, <laughs> if, their, if their family structure is the opposite, then um, it's not going to work. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this uh, article about. A study that I read yesterday, here we go, on the white supremacist or origins of modern marriage advice. I'll say it's again, it's the white supremacist origins of modern marriage, marriage advice. And I think that you have to understand that um, to a large degree, Women were told that guys are going to be entitled and selfish in the marriage and in bed, and they're just going to have to take it because they are just more violent, but they didn't fight it because that same violence ended up, um, like, was the violence that they was used to secure the racial hierarchy, right? So it's not as if people were like terrors in the streets when they were terrorizing the black masses and then came home or an attentive lovers in the sheets. That's just not the case. No, these guys were jerks in the, in the streets and then jerks in the sheets. And then uh, this uh, piece, it's by a woman named Jane Ward. You can just Google Jane Ward. I'll just put it in the, uh, 
I'll just put it in the comments. As And uh, she goes into the eugenic history of white marriage advice, and it was all about just kind of allowing these jerks to be jerks because we couldn't expect them to be just because if they were just, they would actually share power with people that like the whole white family wanted to rule. So the, the, um, the tie between eugenics and patriarchy, you can't really do real gender, th gender theory unless you're also going to do race theory. People who think you can, like, uh, they don't know how gender works. That the way we think about gender has everything to do with what, what is necessary and was necessary to sustain a violent racial hierarchy, a uh, violent racial hierarchy. Like, that's simply the case. And there's more and more coming out. So you need to actually destabilize, if you're serious about realizing a populace that will self-determine itself into a just society, we're going to have to change the way white people think about marriage, which means going right at the institutions that, that propagate this culture. <laughs> this culture of spousal rape. And spousal rape is everywhere in those white suburbs, and they do not talk about it, but it is true. It is true. Like, we're grooming these white women to just eat it for, like, their whole lives, and that is just not, it's just not, it's just, it's just the case, and it's not universal. It is with them. So there is that. And also, there's more and more literature coming out about how the white church turns out white Christianity is white supremacy and is a, <laughs> and is a uh, hotbed of white supremacy. Another article can, today, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put this in the, I'll put this in the file uh, in, the, in, the, this, in the comments for today's section too. But it turns out the white, the, the, the white church is like a white supremacist organization. It shouldn't be surprising. Like history attests this in like 18,000 different ways. Um, but it's, there's more and more literature coming out it, and we're talk, starting to talk about this as a problem, which I appreciate, uh, which, which I appreciate because until we get serious about the white church and the white family, we'll just be surprised when we'll just continue to be surprised when white supremacy rules the elect, uh, like our electoral and political, um, priorities. All right, so here is the white church's white supremacy problem. And there's more and more, there's simply more and more literature coming out about this, that the white church isn't just white by accident. It's white, I like it, it's actually a font and driver of white supremacy, even through its charity activities. So, yeah. Um, so we need to think about the principle of realization of a better, a better world. It's not enough to just think about the structure of, of a better world. You have to think about how you're going to bring it about. And how you're going to bring it about is by, there's going to be a, there's going to be a little bit of power at play, right? So we're going to have to take over these institutions and change the way they think about their role. And then, um, then it'll allow a quality of self-determination for the members of those institutions to not be de facto white supremacists. Right. So I think that you need a principle of realization in any serious left politics, you need to, in any progressive politics. It's not enough just to have all of the right ideas, which I do have a lot of the right ideas, but it's got to be tied with a plan for how it's going to be realized through the activity of individuals. So it's not just going to be education. It's going to be like changing the way that they think about what is important. And so that they will choose of their own to do so. And this is actually what, this is the fight that liberals don't take seriously, but the right actually does. This is why Trump just came out with a, um, well, one of the reasons why Trump just came out with a um, kind of a, a directive to cut funding for all critical studies departments. Now, I teach logic and critical thinking, which means that like all I do is teach people how to investigate these kinds of institutions and institutions of thought control so that they will eventually emancipate themselves from themselves or from like the institutions that have been training them to think a certain way, which is 
not consistent with either their freedom or definitely black people's justice. So instead, I like I teach critical theories. And if Trump would have his way, I'd be able to teach and some feminists would have their way. I'd be able to teach critical theories about everything except race. All right. So, by the way, if you're doing any sort of critical theory, but you're not doing race, then like it's distorting your entire critical enterprise. You're just confusing yourself. You can't do gender without race. You can't do class without race in America. Like, but if you're going to critique any major institutions, you have to critique it also through race. Probably through race first, but definitely also through race. Um, and that's going to destabilize a lot of our cultural institutions, and we're going to... And it would, I think, enable a new birth of freedom if we were to... Uh, nothing I teach in my class can't be taught to a 14-year-old. But nothing I've said in this isn't something you can't have your kids watch. All right, so um, in order for that new birth of freedom, we need to take over cultural institutions. So I think school boards are very important, but not just schools. I'm talking about churches and the way people think about families and like major media markets, right? So we need to actually change the way people think about the role of government in their lives so that they can, of their own, determine themselves as American and, and determine America as a nation of justice. That's... Uh, that has an aspect of justice. And that's only going to happen if we take the long culture wars seriously. Right? It can't, it's not going to, it's not going to work if it's imposed from the outside, right? Let's say I happen to take, I happen to take power, but all of our, and I change all of these things that are, that have nothing to do with culture, but just like policies from the superficial level. But at the end, people are still racist. It's kind of like FDR, right? It's still going to, it's not going to be good for black people. Right? If you don't change the culture of white supremacy, it doesn't, and, the, and, and actually identify its differentiated and variegated uh, institutions of sustenance, it's not going to matter what superficial policies you, you put out because um, you haven't changed the electorate. And we are at least ostensibly a self-governing um, nation, which means that if you're serious about progress, you have to change the electorate's sensibilities about what freedom looks like. And the good news is, I think we have the arguments on our side. The bad news is, the electorate's got a little bit path uh, pathologically attached to injustice. So we're going to have to have a little cultural intervention on our electorate. All right? and, but the, with the end of creating the kind of people who of their own selves can actually self-determine a just electorate. Right now, we're not there. Right now. Anytime we're trying to get 51, to, anytime we're trying to like barely eke by a white supremacist like, like Trump, you're, you're not even close. You're not even close. And Biden and Harris aren't even fighting the right fight. They don't know the right fight. It'll just be another form of white supremacy. I'd feel a little bit bad about saying that if black people were doing particularly well in California, but California is run top to bottom by Democrats and, you know, black, shedding black people because. Democratic politics aren't the best for black people. That's just how it is. So we need to make a new nation and a new electorate, but you need to understand that's going to come with power and that's going to come with some sort of cultural takeover of, of, of non-obvious institutions. But look, after World War II, and I've said this before, after World War II, we made the Japanese emperor like readmit, because they already did it after the Meiji takeover. Um, that he was not a god because we wanted Japan to be a constitutional democracy and you can't have a constitutional democracy when your emperor is also a god. So um, it's not, this isn't that hard to wrap our heads around that religion and family structure, these non-political associations actually matter. But with that, I'm going to let you go and peace. Oh, um, Remember, any real progressive movement also has internal to the movement a prin the principle of its own realization. It's not just going to be knowledge. It's about how are we going to form people to fight for this. And that can't be a matter of catering necessarily to people's appetites as they are. It's a matter of changing their appetites. So all the opinion polls and 
all the opinion polls in the world aren't going to get you there. You need to go after the structure that creates the appetites um, and then do that. Another reason why I don't think healthcare politics is the way, but okay, peace. Political knowledge and insight that will help you not squander your life and kind of rescue meaning from it, then go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in five, fifteen, or fifty dollars a month, or make one enormous donation. I like the monthlies because it allows me to budget more, and that'll help me, you know, with a marketing budget or getting better equipment that works all the time. Because a lot of, in a lot of ways, freedom means having equipment that works every time you turn it on, <laughs> and I want to be a free Negro, so. Um, if you like what I do, go to funkyacademic.com and contribute. Thanks often comes in the form of cash. And the site takes credit cards. America, my name is Amiose Frimpong. And you're watching this week's edition.